Okay, so the question is, what is the meaning of proper faith in Buddhism? It's an interesting topic um, because it's highly polarized, polarizing in Buddhism. There are certain modern Buddhists no, modern meaning, let's say, um, Western Buddhists in the sense that they've come to Buddhism uh, without any cultural background or any, any um, traditional background. So they've come to it directly through the texts or through a modern teacher. And uh, so in general, there's a trend among such Buddhists to discount the concept of faith. They will say... Things like the Buddha taught us to question everything, not believe even him. And so give the general impression that doubt, skepticism, and by extension doubt is useful and faith is useless or even harmful. Faith is, ag is against the Buddhist teaching. There's another extreme. You have traditional Buddhists who are also highly educated, but uh, coming from another approach, who feel, um, and it's actually more through their intense or in, in, in intensive study of the Buddhist teaching. But I'd say you have to admit that it is also partially coming from their um, faith in the Buddhist teaching that that they've they've had since they were young, most likely in most cases. Who will say that you need to establish faith first in the Buddhist teaching? That faith is essential. If a person doesn't have faith, they cannot. Um, progress in the Buddhist teaching. So let's, to deal with this, let, let's look at those two extremes and then uh, try to find something that I would say is more in the middle, more moderate, and maybe a little more appropriate. Uh, so these are kind of straw men or straw people, straw arguments that I've set up, but I don't think they're far off the mark of characterizing the opinions of certain Buddhists. So first of all, the idea you, you have, by by, point, by posting the first straw man, it, it 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 shows the danger of discarding faith because doubt is a hindrance, and faith is a profitable mental faculty. Now this is important to understand, and it's important to properly understand. Because in Buddhism, we don't think of things conceptually. There's no, uh, it's not intellect, an intellectual argument that faith, whether faith is useful or, or harmful. If you say, but faith um, makes people believe in the wrong things. If you have faith in something that is untrue, it can lead to disaster. That's an intellectual argument. It doesn't say whether faith is profitable or harmful. Faith is profitable, according to Buddhism, for the simple reason that it supports the mind. If you, if if all other things being, if all other things considered equal, you know, you, you're you're undertaking something, and you put aside whether that thing is right or wrong, the fact that you have faith in it is going to make it easier for you to succeed in that endeavor. Why? Because faith is a profitable mind state. Faith is something that um, supports the mind. That's what is meant by, by profitable in Buddhism. We don't look at the intellectual argument. It's the same thing about with eating meat. Eating meat is, is karmically neutral. It's ethically neutral because it's not an intellectual argument. The point is that during the moment that you're eating meat, there's no reason why you should have to be um, either a wholesome or unwholesome of intention. Doubt is, is considered to be un profitable because it harms the mind. It, it, it scatters the mind. It 
it fr prevents the mind, hinders the mind. It's a hindrance because it hinders the mind. If you are um, um, acting, you're, you're uh, undertaking some activity, all other, all other things considered equal, doubt is going to prevent you from succeeding in that activity. So it's kind of a narrow definition. Bro broadly speaking, obviously faith can be dangerous, and obviously doubt can be can be quite useful. Doubt is something that, intellectually speaking, is useful in establishing what is true and good. But um, practically speaking, from a point of view of um, actual progress, it's the opposite that faith is actually is actually use, useful and shouldn't be discounted the reason why faith is so dangerous is because it's so powerful if you have faith in the wrong thing um, you can it, it it can destroy you it can destroy lead you to destroy other and harm other people greatly but on the other hand if you have faith in the right thing the power of it so it's like a power tool it's it's something that is quite powerful um, f doubt, on the other hand, is something that is harmful. But in that sense, if you have faith in the wrong things, sowing seeds of doubt can allow you to destroy something that is harmful. You see. So if you have, if you're talking about faith in in wrong view, in things that are faith in in God or the self or so on, sowing seeds of doubt uh, is harmful in a good way. That's the point here. So it's important to understand what you're talking about and, and 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 to be able to differentiate obviously it, it is quite clear that the buddha did not want to have us um well there's no and let's let's look at the other side then to to, to before i explain this on the other side um the if anyone anyone who claims that you need perfect faith in the teachings or that faith in the teachings is necessary before you practice I would say from my admittedly um, partial study of the Buddha's teachings I haven't studied absolutely everything that the Buddha taught and and commentaries and sub-commentaries and so on um, but I, I, I have quite a a broad-based education in the Buddhist teaching, and and it's quite clear to me that that is not what he taught. In fact, his teachings on faith, even when he said it's a good thing, are are by no means um, front and center. Are by no means core to the actual practice. I mean, it's right faith isn't in the eightfold noble path. It's not one of the things that the Buddha singled out as. As necessary, and in fact, as we know, in the Kalama Sutta, for example, there are, there are cases where he was critical of faith and 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 pointed out that faith can pointed out the dangers of faith, which, which are obvious. So, what, what, it came to my this came to my attention recently because someone was saying, well, they, this was what they were told. They were told that the first thing you have to study the Buddha's teachings until you gain this perfect faith in them through study. And the first thing, well, I, after thinking about it for a while, it wasn't the first thing, but but at one point it came to me, and this is it was as I was typing a response to this person's question, and as I after I typed it out, I read it what I had replied, and I said, well, that's exactly it. That what I'd said is, um, there's no reason to believe someone when they tell you you have to believe something, right? So, person is telling you um, you have to believe in the Buddha's teaching, and they're saying, believe me. Believe what I say, you have to believe what the Buddha said. So it's actually kind of a form of question begging. Well, in order to believe um, what the Buddha said, I have to first, I have to first accept that believing what someone says uh, completely is a good thing. You see, so if I'm the sort of person who doesn't believe what people say without reason, then there's no reason why I would accept what you say. It's this, it's. Like, why should I believe you when you say I should believe the Buddha? It was, ba was basically it. And I think it forms a kind of question-begging, circular reasoning. I mean, like, why, why should I believe you in the first place, let alone believe the Buddha? Um, and I think that's 
I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, it's a it's a valid argument. Why should why should I? You know, why you say this? Um, you know, what what are your reasons for saying I should have faith in the Buddha, for example? And I think that's really how the Buddha would have us approach this. Um, obviously, the Buddha said right view is important, uh, and it's important from the beginning of the practice. But the question is whether right view means belief in the things that the Buddha was, was teaching. Um, and, and so it, it's, not, it's not that you shouldn't believe anything or you go into it with an open mind. It's not that you should come and practice thinking that everything is, is possible. Um, there are certain arguments and, and teachings that have to be presented to a person for their evaluation. But here is how I would say it has to be approached. It has to be approached uh, proportionately. A person should have faith proportionately to the um, reasons presented for having, or the, the um, evidence, proportion to the evidence. So, if someone comes up to you and says that there's a God who uh, is going to judge everything you do and send you to hell or heaven based on those, based on your deeds, well, you should examine your reasons for believing that. If someone says to you, on, you know, um, hey, if you practice the way I teach, it leads you to, to complete enlightenment and nirvana and true freedom from suffering and you never have any... Um, you, leads you to not be born again or, or and so on and so on then you have to examine why you should believe that both of these statements are difficult to believe and so I would say um, our appropriate response is to to be skeptical towards those those statements I don't think there's anything wrong with that I think someone who is skeptical about the, re the reality of nirvana um, that's reasonable in the beginning so, um, because the, the alternative is uh, to believe something disproportionate to the evidence. And so this is the, the other thing that, I'd that I think needs to be pointed out, is the consequences of believing something disproportionate to the evidence. So, um, as long as our belief is proportionate to the evidence, we, we will have a sort of a um, equilibrium in our mind, there's a certain sense of, of contentment, right? So you'll never have a feeling of uh, conflict internally. If you believe in something, and this is the curious thing, because obviously if you believe in something like the, the Supreme Creator God who's going to send you to heaven or hell, reality is going to come back and, and hit you hard. And you're going to be constantly bombarded by evidence to the contrary. For example, the widespread suffering in the world or the lack of, of any sort of evidence. You're going to be constantly bombarded with doubt uh, because it's patently not true. It, it goes against reality. But the question is, what if you believe, and this is what how this question arose, what if you believe disproportionately in something that is true. What happens, and what's wrong, is what was presented to me, what's wrong with, with as I said, believing completely the Buddha's teaching before you have any evidence to support it? If, if, if all you had was other people's uh, say-so, what is wrong with believing 100% in everything that the Buddha said? Now, more, more likely or more common is the idea that um, textual study is enough. So it's not actually without any evidence, but the evidence is arguments that have been presented by the Buddha. So but through reading the Buddha's teaching and the commentaries and sub-commentaries, it is often claimed that that is enough evidence to provide reason to have perfect faith in the Buddhist teaching. I would say that's also patently untrue, um, but let's talk about that after. First, let's talk about what if you had no evidence, but suppose you, someone told you, okay, 
um, you practice insight meditation and you become enlightened, what would be wrong with having total faith in that? I think the first thing that comes to mind is it actually, faith actually acts as an inhibitor to investigation, right? Why investigate something if you already know it to be true? And you find this with, with Buddhists. Often people read, so let's just lump it in there. People will do the reading and come up with these reasons to believe, or, or maybe that's not even with reasons to believe, but they, they read about these teachings and it sounds good, and the Buddha is so good at presenting it, and so they, uh, they believe it. They they come to this faith and they feel the rapture and and the, the 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 pleasure of hearing the Buddha's arguments and seeing how he debates and wins debates and so on, and uh, they just feel how great it is and so they just believe in what the Buddha taught, and you'll find that these people are quite often disinclined to actually practice the teachings. They feel content in their knowledge. And in fact, you find this with, with scholars um, quite often, that, that, that the more they study, the less inclined they are to, or maybe not the less inclined, but um, it certainly doesn't make them more inclined. It certainly doesn't bring them to the practice. They can actually become complacent. But, more, but, but beyond that, um, a second problem is that even though, suppose you have X and, and it's in line with reality and you have perfect faith in it without any knowledge. The problem is that faith isn't enough to support that. It isn't enough even to bring you to that realization. So what you're dealing with is not only the faith in it, but you're dealing with wrong view that actually contradicts it in the case of Buddhism. So suppose you have the, knowledge, the, the, the idea of non-self and you have a person who believes 100% in the truth, or they say they do anyway, they, they put, put their faith in and they, they, they suppress any kind of doubt. The problem is that there, this doubt is going to act very similar to um, contrary, contradictory evidence. So even though there is no contradictory evidence, the more you look, or, or reality supports the idea of non-self, your own doubts and your own wrong views are going to conflict with your faith. And so you, you're constantly in a state of, of um, upset, of, of, of you know, distress because of the conflict. It doesn't actually work. Faith isn't um, sufficient to propel a person towards truth. Uh, and, and in fact, the idea that faith is necessary from the beginning is, I don't think, supported at all in the texts. Right view should be um, an understanding that one gains through the practice. So preliminary right view for a person who hasn't yet practiced meditation um, is not the view that nirvana is true or so on. It's, it's right view in a general sense of understanding reality. It's actually in relation to the building blocks of reality. It has to do with an, uh, a vision of uh, what is the nature and what is the makeup of experience. And so what a person should have faith in in the beginning is the basic nature of, of reality. And that's only important because uh, otherwise you can't actually approach reality. So if a person is approaching reality from the point of view of people, places, and things, or the point of view of an external three-dimensional reality, and they're thinking in terms of, of concepts and, and in terms of dimensions and so on, they'll never be able to, under, to, to experience um, their experiences. They'll never be able to observe their experiences objectively and, and clearly. A person has to shift their view. And so a preliminary right view that the Buddha talks about is shifting that view to, to see things in terms of experience. When you move, to be aware of the movement. To not think of it as your foot moving or, or um, moving out, moving 
moving here, moving there, or so on. It's in terms of uh, the experience of the movement. When the stomach rises, it's the experience of the rising. When the when you feel pain, it's the experience of the pain, and so on. Uh, and and there is no need beyond that for faith in nirvana, faith in 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 this or that or the other thing. But the proportionately speaking, that sort of faith. Uh, there should be a, an amount of faith, a certain amount of faith proportionate to the reasonable um, nature of the claims. Uh, and, and at that point, there is also the idea of authority. So, a person teaches you meditation, and you begin to realize the truth, and, and, and the more they advise you, the more you understand. And so you begin to... Um, believe the things that they say. If they make claims about what's going to come next, they'll say, well, if you practice along this path, this happens. So you have some, some, some measure of faith, and again, it's not all or none, but you have some measure of faith because you, they're reliable, and then it, it turns out to be true. So you have greater faith in the things that they say. It doesn't mean that you ever have to have full faith, and you shouldn't, and you can't, because Full faith in what someone says isn't enough. It, again, it, it, even if it doesn't conflict with reality, it will conflict with your own lack of understanding and realization until you actually realize it for yourself. That's why there's a difference between what we call bhavana sadha, which means faith or confidence based on, on meditation or, or actual development. That kind of faith is, is, is unshakable. And that's really what what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about right faith. It's something that is balanced with wisdom or combined with wisdom because it comes through seeing things as they are. You don't ever really have to believe things disproportionate to the evidence. Um, but, but again, the danger being a disproportionate doubt, which is also quite common. People, people think it's one or the other, so if you don't believe something, you're, you're skeptical of it. And so they'll have disproportionate doubt, all constantly doubting the things that they experience. Anyway, just some thoughts on, on faith. I certainly don't believe uh, one extreme or the other. I think, I think I've said, it, said what I meant to say, that faith is useful, beneficial, but dangerous if it's disproportionate.